The life of an addict is not an easy one, and though it is demonized and seen as a choice, I think we can all agree that nobody wants to live that way. You may think that an addict can stop whenever they want, but do you really think it's a choice when it gets to the point that you're losing your marriage, your kids, your car, your house, living on the streets? Any rational person can see that that is not the logical choice to make. But there is a choice in addiction that a person can take and that is choosing sobriety. Now it may not seem like it and it may feel impossible, but it has been proven time and time again that addicts can attain sobriety and recover from their addiction. It is seen in my community every day. Miracles happen every day in my recovery community. I see it all the time from people who come in with a week to a year later, stable with a job and a car and living in independent living. Your life can turn around and you do have that much of a choice. But what about the people whose lives don't turn around? What about the people who come into sobriety thinking that their life will get better for it to only get worse? I was one of those people and I can confidently say that I hit my bottom in recovery. Though it did take a significant rock bottom to get sober, what happened once I got sober was a hell of a lot worse. I faced my own unique challenges coming into sobriety that took years to overcome. We have this saying in my community called the pink cloud and the pink cloud effect is something that happens for a lot of newcomers when they first come into recovery and their lives start to come together because for a lot of people your life improves like right away and the evidence is shown in you know getting your health back on track your family's trust back getting on your feet with a stable job and these are the kind of things that people can pick up pretty early on that show there is benefit to recovery and it is worth staying sober. Um, the pink cloud can carry on for months or years before a person will eventually be faced with a real life challenge. They will have to face life on life's terms. As people say, life gets lifey. And for the first time, that pink cloud will be challenged by real life events. For some people, they do not pick up the tools necessary to handle those challenges while they're on their pink cloud because everything's coasting along fine. They don't need to pick up tools for recovery. And then there are people like me who had to pick them up pretty much from day one and apply them immediately because I didn't get a pink cloud. And in a lot of ways, it was fortunate because I needed to learn these lessons right away, but it definitely sucked. I guess you could say my first week was pretty good because I was riding on that high of being newly sober and being congratulated by people for getting sober and getting the validation of becoming sober. But that was so short-lived. Within the first two or three weeks, one of my friends died and this was someone I was very close with, someone who I considered like a second mother and she was a role model to me. And unfortunately, I did see this coming because she had been in the hospital and her family had actually called me to let me come say goodbye to her. So I did get to see her when she was maybe days away from dying and get to pray with her. I'm not much of a prayer, but I tried and I said my goodbye and it was incredibly hard. I got to do that sober, which is incredible, but that was incredibly hard to do sober because I had never faced death sober. I had lost people before. I had never done anything about it. I had never properly grieved because I stuffed away my emotions with drugs and I numbed myself out so that I wouldn't have to feel those things. And here I am already raw with emotion from having given up my drug of choice and facing even stronger emotions that I would not have ever seen coming, had never thought could happen in early recovery, because I would hear that these things would happen, that eventually you'd stay sober long enough that you'd lose people, but I just didn't think it would happen in the first 15 days. So that was rough. By the time I got to my first 30 days, I did not feel like celebrating because I was on my way to a funeral for my friend. 
And this was, again, the first lesson I learned, um, but as far as grief goes, certainly not the last. I've been sober four years. Every single year that I've been sober, I have lost at least one loved one, and there have been nine deaths in this time, which a lot of people tell me is not common. Everybody seems to assume that because I'm an addict, these nine people all died by overdose, but only two of them did and one of them was a suicide. So that was like an intentional overdose. Another was suicide, one was a logging accident, a couple were cancer. Um, I can't quite recall all of them. A few were old age. It, it was not what I thought my recovery would be like. I had envisioned this whole image of what recovery would be like because I saw everyone around me getting their lives together, getting better, um, becoming happy, and I thought that that was recovery because they tell you it gets better. They don't tell you when, but they tell you it gets better, and I was sold on this, thinking that my life would get better, but I promise you it did not, at least not for a long time, because while I was also dealing with this death of a friend, I was going through psychosis. I had drug-induced psychosis and it did not end for the first, I'd say, eight months of being sober. And this entailed three hospitalizations, a lot of different medication, a lot of side effects, suicide ideations. Um, I think one of the hospitalizations was just for my suicidal intentions. The other two were psychosis because it took a lot of rounds of trying different medication to get me out of that state. So I was psychotic most of my first year sober. And while I did not consider that much of a rock bottom because I have schizoaffective disorder, it was pointed out to me that most people do not go through that. Around the time I was coming out of psychosis or at least starting to become recovered, like going into the phase where the symptoms were lessening, I not only uh, lost my grandpa, um, there was a pandemic. So as a result of this pandemic, I could not be with my grandpa. I video called my family a lot while he was dying and he was in hospice uh, very shortly because he declined incredibly quickly and I was getting updates every day. Um, and you know, I had known this was coming for years because he had been declining and I um, had actually intended to be there. Uh, to care for him at the end. And I was actually hoping to go out um, before I went into psychosis and live with them until the end. I did not get to be there for that. Uh, and that really crushed me, especially because my grandpa was my favorite person. And we had a very, very special bond that everybody recognized was very unique and rare and very special, you know? Uh, his favorite person in the world was my grandma and I was a close second. I was so incredibly close with my grandpa, he was my hero, and losing him was devastating, especially because I could not be there. So the pandemic didn't really affect me, not in the sense of, you know, making my life any worse because I was barely touched, having already been through psychosis and two deaths at this point and um, Aside from that, I really, really leaned into my sobriety. Um, so like I said, I picked up these tools and used them. And by that, I mean that I reached out to people and I told people honestly what was going on with me because I had always been very withdrawn in the past and would not open up to people about my struggles. So I was being transparent. I was calling people for support. I was like doing what I could to be involved in my community which looked a lot like sharing an illegal uh, meeting in the park because we had to social distance and our loophole was to do it outdoors. Um, so I did whatever I could at that time, but I was beginning to feel like, what's the point? Why am I sober? My life is worse. Like, why did I get sober if this is what I got? Still, I put in the effort and I grew a lot and I got through really hard things sober, which I didn't think I was capable. Like I said, this was not my image of recovery. I had shaped out in my mind a completely different life for myself, which I did not get. And acceptance was a huge part of this phase in my life, accepting that my expectations of life were false not to have expectations of what would happen to my life and just to accept it as it went. 
I think what really cemented this was the third death that year, which was my dog. And um, being with him, holding him while he died, because I did get to be there for that one. And being with my stepdad and talking these deep heart to hearts about life and death and realizing that the bigger picture was not that my one year birthday was in a week. It was that I got to be in my family's life today for the important events and that was a lot more important than some one year birthday. So by that point, my sobriety was not around the milestones. It was not around getting things back in my life. It was around being there for the important things and living life um, as it came up like raw and real um, and handling it to the best of my ability um, and not backing down from the challenges that were in front of me. That was my first year sober and I think what I learned from that year, just to sum up, is that reaching out and having a community was key and I needed their support to survive. Being honest and open about what I was struggling with was necessary because in the past when I hadn't been open with people I had always relapsed keeping my problems to myself, having family relationships to get through these hard events and being with them rather than isolating and getting high to manage was the easier, softer way in handling grief. And it was better for all of us to be going through that together as a unit. And just understanding that sobriety was not about the accolades. It was not about the validation. It was not about the shiny milestone coins. It was about having a life that entirely sucks but living it and being present for it, despite how much I was hating my life at that time. I have to say it didn't get better from there, but it did become manageable because in my second year, I learned that my life doesn't get better, I get better. And that was huge to me because I still was trying to let go of this expectation that my life would get better. I genuinely thought after one year, my life would get better. So into my second year, I had to realize, okay, that wasn't true. That wasn't just like one year of hell, this is my life. This is my life. It wasn't like a little marathon. It is the whole journey and I've got to deal with this shit. So I did start going back to therapy and I did start teaching myself therapy tools like keeping a log of my daily activities to track when I would have BPD episodes, getting diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, figuring out the correct medications to be on and finally getting stable on meds. Um, my mental health really became key in that second year because I was finally at least a bit level-headed enough that I could address it. In that first year, I don't think I could have addressed it because things were too chaotic. But in that second year, when there were no events to be upset about and all I was upset about was my life, I realized that I needed to work on myself, not the things happening around me, but myself. And this helped, this helped immensely because like I said, my life did not get better, but for that year and the following year and a half, I coped and I carved out a life for myself while still going through it because I was still having my borderline personality disorder episodes almost daily at that point, they were daily and then they got to weekly and then they lessened and lessened. It took years though. And so in that time, I was learning how to have a life around my mental illness and to still maintain a quality of life while maintaining my health. And so taking care of my health became a full-time job. And I saw it that way. I saw that, okay, I couldn't work. I tried working, I couldn't hold a job. This is my full-time job, taking care of myself because if I can take care of myself and get better enough, then I'll have a different full-time job. But for now, that is what I must focus on. That is where my priorities lie. I had to learn how to have a routine and a schedule. I had to learn to take my medication every day and not miss a dose. I had to learn all the basics because my life had been chaotic for so long up until that point that I didn't even brush my teeth every day. And now I brush my teeth every day and I shower every day and I do all of these things that were impossible before. Psychiatric disability is being unable to do basic things. With physical disability, that is much the same. And that can look like if you have ambulatory issues, not being able to walk without assistance or needing a wheelchair. With your mind though, it's a bit more nuanced because the basic things that are disabling by a psychiatric disability can look like things everyone can do, right? Much like everyone can walk until you see someone in a wheelchair and you accept that they can't. When a person who is able-bodied is having meltdowns in the store, 
it to other people looks like something that's very easy to handle. They cannot see that with that kind of a disability, we struggle with the basic things, much like a physical disability. It's just that our basic things seem entirely easy for everyone but us to do. One of my basic things was going out in public. I have historically had agoraphobia. I had agoraphobia pretty severely for two years when I was much younger. I, I wouldn't say much younger, but when I was in my early 20s. And my agoraphobia is something I still deal with because I never lose the fear of going out. I'm just better at handling it today. So I can go out, but not without that anxiety and fear. So while I may not seem like I have agoraphobia, that is still something I challenge every day. And I challenge it by going on walks or like taking, um, a quick trip to the corner store for a chocolate bar. I make myself do these things, but back then it was nearly impossible. The, the agoraphobia was so bad. The borderline personality disorder was so bad. I couldn't go out in public without assistance. I needed someone with me at all times if I were to go out in public because I would inevitably explode and have these tantrums in front of everyone or episodes, meltdowns, whatever you want to call it. So this, this was something that up until I'd say a year ago was a daily issue in my life. There's this great analogy I heard about sobriety or at least early sobriety, which is that when you are in your addiction, you're basically driving a station wagon and everything you own is behind you. All of your baggage is in the back of the station wagon. And when you get sober, you stomp the brakes and all of this baggage comes flooding to the forefront. So while I was in survival mode and numbing myself, I was able to go out in public confidently. I was not having meltdowns at all. I seemed functional. I may have actually been higher functioning in addiction because I could manage to keep a job for like at least a year in addiction. And I could do all of these things that seemed very basic that I was now struggling to do in sobriety. That was the next challenge for me was how do I manage everything that's come to the surface that I've been stuffing down for so long that I can't look away from without relapsing? The only way I could really make it go away was if I were to start using again. So I had to get rid of it bit by bit by bit myself, working on myself. Um, and that was another big challenge. I don't know what happened, but something must have worked. I think a culmination of many things worked because I slowly got there, I slowly got better. And I think around three and a half years sober, I can confidently say that I gained stability. And I think this is because I had somewhat of an epiphany. Um, I, I feel very uncomfortable talking about spirituality and I always have. It, to me, spirituality feels like talking about sex with your dad or like talking about periods with your dad. Um, so that's how I feel talking about spirituality and I'm like a very reluctantly spiritual person but I had this moment one day where I just felt like an ease and calm and realized I don't have to worry like there's nothing to worry about because I don't need to know anything in this moment and anything I need to know will come to me when I need it so there's nothing to question I can have faith that my life will continue on this path and when something that I need to worry about happens I'll worry about it then but until then I don't need to because it's a problem for the future. And today all I have to focus on is today. After that, my life completely changed and it has been so much better. Um, I'm actually happy, which I had never felt before, at least not consistently, like maybe I'd have fleeting moments and not like mania either, like genuine happiness. And I feel happy every day. Some days I have pockets of feeling miserable, but at some point in every day, I do feel happy. And I have felt that way ever since that epiphany back in March of 2023. So the challenges I've faced in sobriety are just life. Just life, just the things that happen in life because the reason they weren't challenges before was because I'd avoided them, I'd put them on the back burner, I'd stuffed them down, I'd numbed over them. The only way I was able to function was through being high. And the reason I had so much difficulty functioning sober was because I had never had to face any of this sober. I had never dealt with my mental health, um, not seriously. I had never seriously dedicated myself to recovering my mental health. You know, I had never grieved. I. 
I went through a lot of changes, you know, finding out I had borderline and learning how to manage that. And everything that came with getting sober was just a product of life. So the challenges that I faced in sobriety that I think anyone faces are just life. It's life on life's terms. It's life as it happens to you. The challenges aren't necessarily like being triggered to use again, although that is a challenge for a lot of people. Sometimes the challenges just look like getting fired. And how do you deal with that without relapsing? Because you've never been fired sober before. Um, just having to do things sober and not relapse over them because anything is a challenge if it triggers you to relapse. You don't even have to want to relapse for it to be a challenge. It's just a life challenge that is happening to you in a new way. Processing things sober, um, managing things sober. The reason there's sobriety challenges is because for the first time you're learning how to live life sober. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you sticking around. Um, got a lot of exciting stuff coming up and I am sorry that I missed the last upload because it was Thanksgiving and I don't handle Thanksgiving very well. It's a difficult day for me. Um, but it did give me an opportunity to work on some future videos. So there will be more educational content coming your way. Things about personality disorders and psychosis, of course. And uh, for anyone interested, I'm maybe going to be doing another interview with someone on this channel. You can look out for that. Uh, two schizophrenics talking about their lives together. Anyway, that's all I have for you. So thanks anyway, I will see you in the next one.